Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back to Fading Memories. Today with me is Sivia Green, and she is going to be talking to us about a topic that I know nothing about, so this is a good one to chat about, all things Medicaid. And I told her I have to remember to call it Medicaid and not Medi-Cal. So thank you for coming on and filling us in on everything we need to know about Medicaid. Thank you, Jennifer, for having me on. I'm excited. Welcome. So you have a company that deals specifically in Medicaid services. So do you want to start there or I'm not even sure where's a good place to start. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Yes. So Sensible Senior Planning, we are a Medicaid planning service, and we assist um, individuals and seniors and their loved ones with the Medicaid planning process and the actual Medicaid application process. So I've heard, I've heard the process can be quite challenging. Yes, it is. You know, definitely a lot of documentation that's required, um, a lot of knowledge that's required so that you know what documentation is required and you know what to do with assets, what you can do, what you should do, um, you know, and what your options are. So definitely it is, it is a process that is very daunting, especially when you're not a professional at it. Or like dealing with people, like I, I just... I don't deal well with banks, insurance companies, any of those regulated type things. It's just, I don't know what it is. I have like a visceral reaction, two minutes on hold, and I'm just like losing my mind. So I leave that stuff up to my husband, which is much better. <laughs> yes. So yes. I know a lot of people get to a position where they're taking care of a parent and the parent needs to go into a care home for one reason or another, and they have some assets, but not a lot. Or I know, for example, there's a gal in my support group who feels that her husband would benefit for a care home, but they can't afford it. And she obviously would like to continue living in her home. So these are kind of, I'm sure, things that you deal with every single day. So I don't know if that's a good place to start in the conversation. Definitely. Definitely. So there's a big misconception that if, you know, for someone to get onto Medicaid, Medicaid is going to take all of their money. And that's not the case. The case is in order to be eligible for Medicaid, of course, the numbers that I'm going to throw out are different in every state, but we'll say most states, in order to be eligible for Medicaid, your assets, so liquidated assets, Non-liquidated assets, you know, can't exceed $2,000. Now, there are exceptions. In many states, you're allowed to own one car and you're allowed to own a house if you're anticipating to return. So that's, you know, what everyone hears. And, you know, again, it's, it's well, then Medicaid's going to take all my money, so I only have $2,000 left. It's not like that. That's just in order to be eligible. When you look at it black and white, that's what's needed. Now, there are, I like to say when you look at a black and white, because there are many, many gray areas. Medicaid understands that when there's, you know, a spouse, someone who's living at home, and there's someone who's in a nursing home, they understand that the spouse that's living at home wants to stay living at home, and Medicaid wants that. So there's a lot of ways, especially when there's a spouse involved, there are a lot of ways to save assets, turning assets into income. So where you can take some of the assets and put them into a specific Medicaid compliant annuity and turn it into an income. And that way, the spouse who's living at home still has the financial resources for that. Um, you know, and of course, there are other ways as well that individuals can preserve some of their assets and spend down. There is gifting. Um, when you're working with a professional, you are able to do some gifting where you can gift away money and then long story short, you then use some of money that's in an annuity or in an income that, that you pay out for the penalty period. Um, so basically what I'm trying to get at is it is complex. Um, there's a lot of gray areas um, and there's a lot really to learn. So trying to take away that fear that, um, you know, in order to be on Medicaid, I'm going to have to also move into a nursing home or we're going to have no money. Neither that's of those fear. are good choices. <laughs> right, right, exactly. 
Exactly. It's a realistic fear, but it's not um, the be all end all. So now I think I'm correct in stating that Medicaid does not pay for like a long term memory care residence type community. Because so those are different than nursing homes. I think. Are you referring to like a um, assisted living facility, a memory care assisted living? Yes. The, it, so that's state specific. There are some, yes, yes, there are um, many states actually, more and more states are starting to pick up on that where Medicaid or another government um, program similar to Medicaid um, will pay for assisted living facilities. The big issue is, is that the payout of Medicaid is significantly less than private pay. So not many assisted living facilities um, have accept Medicaid. And a lot of assisted living facilities that do accept Medicaid, they only have maybe five or 10 beds that are set aside for accepting Medicaid. Um, and the wait list can be really long. It's, I think it's changed a little bit because a lot of people have pulled their loved ones out of those kind of communities. And I'm assuming a private, like my mom was at a private corporate run assisted living memory care community. And my first instinct because i'm ms practical would be like okay well you take the medicaid money and then you pay the rest that probably doesn't right. work that way either no it doesn't because you yep you can't be approved for medicaid unless if you reach certain requirements so medicaid won't do that exactly seems like that would be a good option but i'm sure there's a hundred reasons why that's not the case <laughs> besides that yeah. we probably bankrupt the system that's what i was going to say it probably comes down to the dollars you know, comes down to the dollars. That is very, very likely. Yes. So besides the fact that we should all plan ahead, knock on wood, and have long-term care insurance, which can be pricey when you start getting it in your, you know, your more advanced years, which I think I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what other things should people know about Medicaid and, you know, maybe... If they're loved one, they can still keep them at home, but they're like, yeah, I'm thinking down the road. What should they start maybe contemplating and start doing? So what I would recommend is the first thing that, you know, that I would recommend is don't do too much Googling. Don't go on Reddit too much. Don't go on Facebook pages. Um, there's a lot of false information and a lot of information that will definitely provoke anxiety and fear. So what I would say is what should be done immediately is really is talk to a professional. So either speak with a Medicaid planner, um, you know, and, and sure you can find just from looking online, um, us, you know, sensible senior planning, we service across 50 states. So you can always reach out to us. We'll give the information towards the end. Um, or you can speak with an elder law attorney. Um, I will specify though, that in speaking with an elder law attorney, one of the things is if you do have concerns about Medicaid and you anticipate your loved one or you needing that in the future, make sure that the elder law attorney is um, knowledgeable with Medicaid planning. Um, so often, you know, individuals go to elder law attorneys and, and it, it's great. I work very, very closely with many elder law attorneys, but there are many that aren't familiar with Medicaid planning. So the advice that they're giving you can be wonderful, but it may not be the advice that you're specifically looking for if you have you know, you're anticipating needing Medicaid in the, in the future. You're not someone that has two, three, four million dollars. Um, so that's really what I would recommend. I know I've been asked a lot what the difference is between a Medicaid planner and, and an attorney. And I will, you know, just to make it clear again, I work very, very closely with many attorneys. We're contracted with some attorneys. What we do a little bit different, though, is that we have that um, you know, the resources from a, a legal standpoint when needed. We also have other resources. So we, you know, have the health and life insurance. Um, we have an individual who specializes in health and life, life insurance. So in that case, we are able to do annuities. Um, we are often, you know, when you're going legal, you're not really looking at that route. We do have an individual who is licensed to do funeral homes in all 50 states as well. So we have that route at all. So we kind of are able to take a very comprehensive look um, and our recommendations are, um, you know, comes from different angles and what suits each individual case. So that's one thing that's different than going to an elder law attorney. The other thing, of course, is pricing. Um, our pricing comes, you know, nowhere near elder law attorneys. They 
Of course, because of their background and their education, um, the price is definitely significantly higher than going to a Medicaid planner. Um, and that's another reason why, another difference, I should say, between a Medicaid planner and an elder law attorney. That makes sense. Because I've always heard, well, you should go to a, an elder, elder law attorney. It's not so easy to say. And I wasn't super familiar with businesses like yours because my parents had plenty of assets to take care of my mom. We had plenty of assets to take care of her had she lived much longer than she did. So, you know, this is why I don't know anything about it because I did not have to go through this process. So maybe can we like walk through and a typical process is probably not something that exists, but like the, a basic, you know, I'm a spouse in my 80s, my, my other spouse needs to be moved someplace. I can't continue to do it. My, you know, my health and physical and mental health is breaking down. They need to, they need to go to a nursing home or someplace anywhere. Are yes. there, is, do they have to specifically go to a nursing home or does Medicaid pay for like in-home care? To yep. So in some states, Medicaid does pay for long-term care. Um, long-term care Medicaid pays for at um, in-home Medicaid. Um, it's in some states it's considered it's called like a different waiver program. Just the names fluctuate, but provide similar services. The biggest difference is though is that Medicaid won't typically cover 24 hours of at-home care because then right everyone would be home with 24 hour, many people would be home with 24 hour care if it's it's covered. So they'll provide a couple of hours, um, but not 24 hours typically, and not um, like eight. Not eight hours. It really depends on the client's need um, and what Medicaid chooses to cover for them. There is no guarantee. All yes. these gray areas. <laughs> exactly. A lot of gray areas. Well, well, what happened is if we do get a call, we do also offer a senior care referral program. So we do work closely with nursing homes and we are able to assist in getting someone, a loved one into a nursing home as well. Um, but what usually happens is when we get that call, um, we have a free consultation, so either we'll do it during that call if the individual has some time, or we'll schedule another follow-up call. That usually takes about 30 minutes. Um, we go over, I like to say we go over definitely family dynamics, because that's important to get a, a, a background. Um, you know, We go over assets, and we go over income. Um, we also review, which usually goes back to family dynamics, to see if there was gifting that was done, um, or if there was any any fraudulent activity you, we find often that could be done. Someone's been living at home and they hired a, um, caregivers. The caregivers may have done some fraudulent or whatever else, but it's important for us to know that um, for one applying for Medicaid. Um, after that, we will, you know, once we go over the consultation, we will discuss, see if we think our services, sensible senior planning is a good fit for the client or if we would recommend them um, going elsewhere. We then usually will review, you know, how the Medicaid process works with them. Um, we'll discuss options that they have. If required and for us to speak with an attorney, we will get the attorney involved at that point as well, um, depending on the complexity of the case. They, you know, we, we tell them the options. Then, of course, we quote um, a fee. Um, once they decide they definitely want to go ahead and use our services, they'll sign a very basic contract and a release of authorization information so that we have access to speak to the county assistance office on their behalf. Um, so that gets done. They say, okay, we want to use this. They sign the paperwork, they send that back. From there, it's assigned to a caseworker and that will be the one and only caseworker that will be working with them for, until there's an actual approval. So from beginning to end, we will go if there's a denial or, you know, if we have to do an appeal, we do all of that until there's an actual Medicaid approval. Um, if it's a case where, you know, the case scenario that you had given me is kind of, it's not so much Medicaid planning, it's more um, going towards the Medicaid application process. So that's why I'm kind of going, veering towards there, talking about the application, like we're there until approval. But what we would do is, you know, really work on advocating for the spouse that's living at home that's going to still be living at home, what we would do is really advocate that some of the others, the other spouse that's going into a nursing home, his income gets rerouted to her, that she can keep most of the assets. Um, in most states, it usually is around, they can keep usually around $120,000 in assets. So we want to try and advocate that she can keep that. Um, and that's not including a house or a car. 
So we take care of all that. We do all that advocating. We assist in gathering all necessary paperwork, um, five-year bank statements, Mm -hmm. 401k, IRA, social security, proof of social security income, everything. We assist. We do all of that with the family. Um, And then we submit a Medicaid. We fill out the Medicaid application and we submit it. Um, Through the whole process, we would be in touch, of course, with the family. And then if the individual is in a nursing home or looking to go into a nursing home with the nursing home as well. I know in my area, there are not very many nursing homes, and most of the ones that take Medicaid, Medi-Cal in California, are generally a place that you would want your loved one. They're they're not great. (laughs) That's the best. It's from what I understand. Again, my mom was in a lovely facility. They took excellent care of her. You know, my dad did pretty good planning ahead. Their house was paid for. That was a huge benefit. Um, it was under the Prop 13 taxes, which people that are outside of California probably are like, huh? They yeah. they basically capped the property taxes. So 50 years later for them, what my parents paid in property taxes for the year is what I was paying for the month. My dad would complain and I'd be like, excuse yeah. you? you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I right. can't, I can't, like, I can't wrap my head around this complaint here, buddy. Yeah. And so we rented out her home to a really nice family. And that covered at least, it covered about half of her expenses. Her social security was another 25%. And then my dad's investments, the financial planner put in the other $1,500 a month to, you know, so she had plenty of money which was lovely because then we didn't have to worry about running out of money a time when she needed more and more care. So um, there was a question I had. Oh, first off, you guys, <laughs> when you're talking about all this paperwork that you have to collect and gather, my mental image was, here's money, do that for me. Because <laughs> that is the thing I cannot do. I just right. That's my husband's job. He was in banking for 20 years. Now he's a real estate broker. So Stacks and stacks and stacks of paperwork is his life, and stacks and stacks of paperwork make me feel like screaming and running out the door. So, yeah. <laughs> a definite yin yang oh, yeah, yeah. in our relationship there. So, yep. oh, the question I was going to ask you popped back in my head. Thank goodness. I've heard that it's really typical. You go through this whole giant process, which again, too much paperwork for my sa- sanity, and then you get rejected, like. It's, it's, it's almost like that's the first step. You do all this work and they're like, yeah, nope, go away. Is that typical when the, you work with you guys or another company similar to yours? Or have you guys kind of dialed it in so that that doesn't happen as often? Or is that just a myth? I don't know. Yeah. So the good thing is, is that we, you know, us working with many Medicaid offices, we have very good relationship with them. Um, what we do is also, we like to say, we tie, we get the entire application completed. We submit all of the paperwork prior to them asking for it. We submit paperwork that we anticipate them asking for. We like to tie the paperwork up in a nice bow. We send it off to them and it's, you know, it's really spoon fed to them. So they like it. It's, you know, it's, it's pleasurable for them. They feel like they're working with someone who's responsible and who knows what they're doing. And we definitely find that they're not very nitty gritty. Um, that often, I, I don't want to say all the time, but often they're not very nitty gritty. We don't typically get denials. Um, what would happen is, is that they come back and they ask for a lot of information. Um, but that's what, that's usually what happens to most people and, and working like nursing homes, when you're going through the nursing home, that's usually what's going to happen. You can get a paper, you're not approved because we need all this information. So you just now have to start gathering all that information when we go and we gather all that information prior. So the process is just smooth. That makes sense. Yes. Back in the day when my family and I had um, the one hour photo lab and portrait studio, we did a lot of immigration photos. And they had, we had a little clear, I don't know, it's, it was basically a, a guide to make sure that the head, the head size had to be a certain size from top to bottom and left to right. And all of the one ear had to, it was very complicated. Sometimes they would send those pictures back and, you know, the client would come back and say, they rejected these, make me some new ones. And it's like, did this person not have their Wheaties today? Because... This fits the, ex- I mean, this is exactly what they asked for. It's so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, everybody's head is different. You'd have somebody with a really long face. So 
it would be too long and not wide enough. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Smish the guy's face? It was just like, right, right. It was, it was dealing with the government is just insane. Since we're talking about paperwork and trying to keep the insanity to a minimum, what should people, if they know that they're going to have to maybe start going through this process, what can they do in the, maybe before they call somebody like you guys? What should they be prepared to gather? I guess is probably a, a good thing because you said five years of bank bank information, and my first instinct is, oh. But I also know that it's all online, and my husband has access to it all. I mean, I have access to it, but he knows how to find it faster, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, my first reaction is, oh, geez, no, and then I'm like, okay, no, it'll be fine. So maybe if people are aware of what will be likely expected, they can. You know, maybe if you wrap your head around it, it's not such a giant, scary yeah. process. So the five-year bank statement, oh, so I'll get to five-year bank statements after. What I would say is initially what you should definitely have is know the individual that you're applying for and their spouse, know what the income is. Um, in some states, if your income is too high, you, you won't be qualified for Medicaid unless if you set up what's called a qualified income trust. So you want to know what the income is. And you want to know any assets. So assets include 401k, IRA, checking, savings, life insurance policies, any properties, cars, house, um, any of that you want to know about. And the third thing I would say is you really want to educate and not, not educate, but you really want to find out if there was any gifting that was done. Um, even if it's just $100, $200, do not be afraid, but just know about it. So you want to find out about any gifting that was done. And the way that you can, if, if, you know, let's say your loved one who you're working on, your power of attorney, but you don't know all that information, then what you would want to do is get six months bank statements. And usually if you give six months bank statements, either you can look through it or you give it to Medicaid planner. They usually at that point can find out what are notable assets that Medicaid will find out about or what are in, what is the income. Um, the the other thing, one other thing that I did leave out, which that you would want to find out as well, is about um, taxes. If taxes has been done, or if there was any debt that's owed. Oof. <laughs> yes. See all yes. that. This is the creative part of me that says, "Ick, no, hubby, you do all this stuff." <laughs> right. Exactly. Because my mom, he did do a lot of that, um, just because it's it's his thing. You know? Yeah. We did our trust recently, and. I knew the the attorney very well and I, you know, I trusted him, which I guess that could be dangerous, but it's like, I know from our conversations that everything was the way I wanted it. So I didn't have to read all of that legal ease, but the husband did right. <laughs> at least most of it. And there was things, there was something I was talking to somebody the other day for the podcast and they said something and when we were done he popped his head in and he goes oh by the way yeah all that's in our trust i'm like oh good. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome he, he i knew i could almost well he must have heard the little thought bubble go over my head going i better double check that <laughs> so right, you know right. that's that's how we that's how we roll in this household what <laughs> other things should people be aware of like i said since i'm like completely clueless I don't even really have good questions to ask, I feel. Yeah, no, you definitely have asked really good questions. I think, you know, the, the, I'll talk a little bit about, because I know I get calls a lot of asking about this, about three things. Number one, I want to talk a little bit, I alluded to that before, the income, the qualified income trust, also known as the Miller Trust. So in many states, Medicaid looks at your income. So the income is usually around in those states your income usually can't be more than 2349 in some states 2199 in other states so i would say around the low 2000 mark if your income does exceed that you won't be eligible for medicaid unless you would set up what's called a qualified income trust also known as a miller trust and what that does is it takes your over resourced money so money where you are, your income is too high, your over income, I should say, limit is too high. Take some of that money and it puts it into this qualified income trust, which a family member or a friend, someone has to be the beneficiary of that. And the money essentially sits there. 
Um, it can be used for some things. Um, every state, again, is a little bit different, but it can be used for like healthcare. Some things can be used for, but the money, the over-resourced money sits there. There's So that's if you're over income. So no, again, if you hear, I get this so many times, I won't be approved for Medicaid because I'm over income. It's a simple trust that needs to be set up. Um, it costs all about $500. You probably can find an attorney to do it for. You can find a Medicaid planner that can do it. We do it $500. The other thing is um, where I had spoken about was the Medicaid compliant annuity. So I want everyone, you know, to be aware that this exists. I was made aware that there are mer many Medicaid planners that um, don't necessarily realize that this exists. And a lot of times people are spending down in a nursing home, but a Medicaid compliant annuity specifically for a spousal case can be very helpful, but in other scenarios as well, that's where you set up where your assets become your income now. And there's ways again that 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 and every situation is different, but there's ways in that way too that instead of just spending down and paying the nursing home privately, you can actually preserve some of the assets. Um, the third thing that I want everyone to know about, I see this way too often, is funeral homes. So often, you know, I speak to people and I say, "Well, do you have funeral homes set up?" They're like, "Yeah, we actually just did it about two months ago because you know things weren't looking good." Um, and I, you know, first question I say, is it irrevocable? And they don't even know what that is. The funeral home doesn't even know what that is. So if you set up a funeral a funeral trust or you, you pay for a burial arrangements and a funeral home um, and it is not irrevocable, it has to be specifically irrevocable, then it is con considered an asset. And now you can be over-resourced because of that. So you want to make sure it's irrevocable. There's many ways to do that. You can either do it directly through your funeral home. Again, we have the resources where you're able to go ahead and um, sign up for like what's an, an a irrevocable ins funeral insurance policy, so to say. It's like a funeral trust. You buy into that. And you can use it at any funeral home. So, you know, definitely, again, I, I say make sure it's irrevocable and speak to professionals about that. So those are three points that I think just, you know, many times I've been, I've been getting a lot of phone calls of people anxious or, you know, they've been told one thing, they're not sure. Um, so those are just three points that I definitely want to make known that exist out there. We made a good point earlier on, don't Google. <laughs> just, yes. That's, yes. I've never done that. So I don't, I'm sure it's like going into MedMD. Right. want to do that <laughs> or WebMD. And you know the fa I've seen this question on the Facebook support pages, and I'm going to read them closer now that I'm informed, so yes. that I can tell people save yourself the headaches. Just find and what is it? The Medicaid seat placement the Medicaid planner. Planner. There we go. Medicaid you planner. Just, yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure I have the right right term. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell them, I know a good one if you, if you guys need a reference, because <laughs> I know a lot of those pages don't like promotion of any kind. Right. And it's just, oh my gosh, it's so crazy. And like I said earlier, my first instinct was, here's money, you take care of it, because I know how insane this kind of, just, just talking to you about it makes me nuts. Yes. <laughs> and it makes me very happy that we have our ducks in a row. Hopefully we're doing what my dad did, so... But maybe we should do the long-term care insurance too, because you know my grandmother's almost 103, so it's oh wow, um, yeah, you know that's that's a many more years. What is that? 49 more years for me? That's a long time. Uh. So that's probably the next thing we've talked about looking into that. And I did do a podcast episode on long-term care insurance, which I figured people would be like, "Ugh, boring." Not listening to that. That was a very popular episode. Oh, so that's sure, great. I'm sure this one will be too. What else? Is there anything else? Like any reassurances? What else? What, what else would you tell somebody that's like me going? Ah! <laughs> yeah, what I would say is, is again, it's a lot of fear and anxiety that takes people over when you have the proper guidance and the proper support. People will get to see that it's not as complicated as it's made out to be. And it's and it's it's not it shouldn't be that complicated. Um, so if you have the right guidance and the right support, um, everything will go smoothly. Essentially, it would end up saving a lot of, you know, a lot of time and a lot of headache. Which is important if you're taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. You have enough challenges and things to take care of. You don't need to be digging through paperwork while 
they're trying to get your attention or they're needing something. <laughs> it's just, exactly. You know, I just feel like this is, this is a very important service for people to take advantage of, you know, just, just saving your sanity, I'm sure is worth the fee because I, yeah. I keep thinking 50 states, 50 different rules, different people. I'm like, you guys probably should get as much money as attorneys. <laughs> Right. Well, and I did also want to say the fee to pay for a Medicaid planner actually is a Medicaid allowable expense. So meaning if you're a family that is, I should have said this many more times, very much sooner, but if you're a family member and you know, you're working with your loved one, you don't have to worry. You're not going to, you, unless if there are no assets for your loved one, you're not going to be paying for the fee. Medicaid allows for you to take some money out of your loved one's account to pay for this service. So this sounds like a no brainer, unless you right. have no money, Correct. just call a Medicaid planner, call you guys, right. save yourself the freaking out, anxiety, stress. I know with me, there would be tears. And I'm assuming in the long run, it saves time too. Yes. You, you guys know what you're doing versus getting, I don't want to say bad advice on the Facebook pages, but maybe incomplete advice as a, proper way of putting it exactly because exactly. you never know where those the person who's answering you and they always say what the responses i've seen well it's always state specific but and then they throw right. in their two cents worth so right you know. after you've read those just forget everything call a medicaid planner i don't i don't see any reason why you wouldn't and i'm really right. glad exactly. we had this conversation because man that just that one piece of information to me was worth the whole the whole chat Good, good, good. So am I. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.